Please turn in the back of your hymnals, Psalter hymnals, to page 863, 62, I'm sorry, 862, Belgic Confession, number 22. I'll read the article. You can follow along. Article 22, The Righteousness of Faith. We believe that for us to acquire the true knowledge of this great mystery, that is the great mystery of the righteousness of faith, (coughs) the Holy Spirit kindles in our hearts a true faith that embraces Jesus Christ with all His merits and makes Him its own. No longer looks for anything apart from Him. For it must necessarily follow that either all that is required for our salvation is not in Christ, or if all is in Him, then he who has Christ by faith has his salvation entirely. Therefore, to say that Christ is not enough, but that something else is needed as well, is a most enormous blasphemy against God. For it then would follow that Jesus Christ is only half a Savior. Therefore, we justly say with Paul that we are justified by faith alone or by faith apart from works. However, we do not mean, properly speaking, that it is faith itself that justifies us, for faith is only the instrument by which we embrace Christ, our righteousness. But Jesus Christ is our righteousness, crediting to us all His merits and all the holy works He's done for us and in our place, and faith is the instrument that keeps us in communion with Him and with all His benefits. When those benefits are made ours, they're more than enough to absolve us of our sins. I have a number of passages to read from the book of Romans, starting at Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Romans chapter 9. This is the larger text. Romans chapter 9, 30 through 10, 17. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were, based on works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, They did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law, that the person who does the commandments (coughs) shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. 
and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. May God enrich your souls by his Holy Spirit through his word this morning. Let us pray. Father, we do ask that you would illumine us into the truth of what your word is saying. For many are deceived. They are in darkness, even though they read the words and hear the words. So we pray there would be not a, re a retaining of darkness, but rather a renewal by the visitation of thy Holy Spirit in knowing the truth and in believing it, the very truth of the righteousness of Christ for us and our salvation. For we pray in his name. Amen. Well, we've been looking at the Belgic Confession. We've learned that man was created in the beginning by God, Adam and Eve. And yet, though created by God upright, men have fallen. Adam fell. He ate of the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we, along with Adam and in Adam, are also fallen. That is what has been called the doctrine of original sin. That we are both condemned and corrupt. We're condemned by Adam's transgression, sh sharing in it, and we are corrupted by it in that his nature is fallen and now so is ours. And yet, we learn in the Belgic Confession that even though mankind has fallen deep into depravity and sin and allegiance to the devil, that God has chosen to save a people, to recover them. And well, the question is, how will he recover fallen mankind? You might ask the question, well, isn't it over? I mean, it's said and done. He made the decision. He made the wrong one. He sinned and rebelled. Uh, Adam, along with his race, are all sinners and servants of Satan and under God's just judgment. Isn't it over? The answer is no, it's not over. Praise God. God is determined to recover those whom he has chosen through a person, Jesus Christ. And we've learned from the Belgic Confession, haven't we, that Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ that we speak of is the Jesus Christ who is one person with two natures. 100% God, 100% man, two natures and one person forever. This is the unique person of Jesus Christ. And the big saving difference with regard to Jesus Christ in his person is that he has done what Adam has not done, what none of us has done. He has obeyed God. From conception to cross, flawless. Holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners. And yet, born of a woman. Now, to be born of a woman generally means you're born sinful. If you read that little phrase in the book of Job, Job's accuser said, look, you're born of a woman, aren't you? Well, okay, you're a sinner. <laughs> well, Jesus Christ is the one difference. He's born of a woman, indeed, yet born without sin. He was born under the law. So the obligations of the law are, are applied to Christ's humanity. And how did it fare? Well, he was righteous. Born of a woman, born under the law, and has fulfilled all the obligations of the law, have rung every bell of the commandments of God in perfect obedience and without sin. So last week we learned that the perfect Lord Jesus Christ was the spotless lamb that offered himself for atonement to make payment for our sins, securing for us forgiveness. Forgiveness. 
We learned that big word propitiation. Justice is satisfied. So that if we believe in Him, we can be saved. But when we speak of the work of Christ, the atonement secures our forgiveness, but that's not the whole picture. Indeed, it's true. Our sins keep us out of heaven. We need forgiveness. But our, but our forgiveness of our sins does not get us into heaven. Righteousness is required to get into heaven. And that's the other piece of the formula. Yes, on one hand, Galatians 3.13, Jesus Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us upon the cross. But on the other hand, Romans 10.4, which I read, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Now, there's two kinds of righteousness with regard to the law. There's the righteousness that's received by faith, and there's the righteousness which is by way of works. And those two kinds of righteousness, faith and works, should never be confused. It will always be kept separate in our minds because it will determine what it is we're trusting in. And what are we trusting in? Well, the Belgic Confession explains to us what, we're, what we are to trust in, not ourselves, but in our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. As it says, we believe that for us to acquire the true knowledge of this great mystery, the righteousness of faith, the Holy Spirit kindles in our hearts a true faith that embraces Jesus Christ. Christ and makes him and his merits our own so we don't look to anything else but to Christ alone for salvation if you have your bulletin with you you have the outline of the bulletin Christ alone for righteousness you see each and every one of us are headed for a day of God's righteous judgment Romans chapter 2 wherein we will give an account on the basis of our works and their conformity to God's law. Now, this is not a joke. This is not just a, a you know, religious rattle. This is not just a, a, a distant dream that is so far out there, it probably will never come to pass anyway. No, the truth is, which we must solemnly consider, as we are headed to this great day of God's righteous judgment, where according to our works, He will determine whether we are condemned or we are justified. Romans chapter 2.13 tells us that the doers of the law in that day will be justified. So there it is. You want to go to heaven? You want to be justified in that day? Very simple. Just keep God's law and all will be well. If you have a lick of spiritual sensibility about you, you would have just heard what I said and you would have said to yourself, I'm in deep trouble if that's the way it works. It is the way it works and you are in deep trouble. What is the expected outcome of appearing before God in that final day to be judged on the basis of your works and conform to the law of God, Romans chapter 3 tells us, what? That by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Rather, every mouth will be shut. What does that mean? That means you have nothing to say for yourself in that day. That's what. <laughs> You'll be defenseless. Because you and me all together have not kept God's law. That's why. And we're headed to our day when we're going to be judged on the basis of our conformity to that law. Well, what now? Well, even though we, you, me, all of mankind, since Adam and Eve, that day is a day of wrath and terror. But praise God, there is one born of a woman there is one born under the law and all of its strict demands who stands before God and was justified in His sight. There is one who achieved perfect righteousness, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. 
Romans chapter 5 holds him in contrast to Adam who is condemned and trespassed as one who is righteous and was, and was justified before God. And thus Romans 10.4 tells us that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. There it is. He's the telos. means the goal. What all the law points to and calls for, Jesus completed it. And thus inherited eternal life. Why was Jesus raised from the dead? It's because He was perfect righteous. That's why. And that's what the law called for. Now that what Jesus Christ has accomplished, righteousness through Christ alone, means therefore our salvation and righteousness is by grace alone. Now when we say grace alone for righteousness, what do we mean by that term? We mean that, it, that God is the one who's done the work. That's what we mean. It's what God has done, not what we do. Grace alone. God's work, God's favor in our behalf. Grace, not ours. Now what does that mean? What does that concretely and practically mean? Grace alone for righteousness. Well, here's how some interpret grace alone for righteousness. God will enable me to have a new heart and conduct of righteousness in my life. Before, I was without grace, and all my efforts was just me trying to be a good person. But now that I'm trusting in Christ... I'm trusting in grace. God enables me to really and truly obey Him and please Him and keep His law. He gets the credit because it's it's His grace working in me. It's not me anymore. Praise be to God. Now that sounds like that that's pretty good. Isn't it? The answer, the burning question that must be leveled, is this the perfect righteousness that will stand inspection on God's day of righteous judgment? This new, spirit-wrought, grace-directed life that I live out in this world. Will that stand before God's righteous judgment in the final day? The answer is no. That's true, I need God's grace working in my heart to live a holy life. Not disagreeing with that at all. But for righteousness that will pass the inspection of God's holiness according to the perfection of His law, my best moments with the Spirit of God working in me by God's grace is still tainted by my sins. Again, God's law calls for perfection. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, quoting from Deuteronomy. Cursed is everyone who does not abide, what? In all things written in the book of the law to do them. It's not just most of the things or a pretty good run at it or, or, or a run at it that's now by grace instead of just by your own fleshly efforts. No, it's all perfection. That's what's called for. That will pass God's inspection of the righteousness of works. And that's why we must answer no. Paul also sets works or doing in opposition to faith for righteousness. That's exactly what he says in Romans chapter 9, verse 30 through 10.4. There's the righteousness of doing And there's the righteousness of faith. They're in opposition to each other for righteousness. 
And if the righteousness that I'm talking about is, is a righteousness by God's grace, but me doing, living it out in my life, that's a righteousness of working. And Paul says, uh, for, for righteousness sake, for a righteousness that stands God's inspection of a perfect righteousness is not by doing, it's by faith alone. Believing. It's, it's all of what God has done in Christ. And that's why we read in Romans 10, 4, that Christ is what? He is the end of the law. For righteousness. What does the law call for? The law calls for works. For doing. And Christ is the end of that law. For righteousness. Why? Because he did it. Because he did it. He achieved the righteousness that the law called for. And thus he puts an end to seeking righteousness by doing the law. He fulfilled. He reached. He completed completely the law's end of works for life. And thus, Jesus Christ alone brought the righteousness required for life. The righteousness of obedience to God's law. And so when we say righteousness by grace alone, righteousness by grace alone, what do we mean? We do not mean the, the righteousness that comes out of your life through the operation of the Holy Spirit helping you to be a more holy person. That's not what we mean. What we do mean is that Christ has done it, not we ourselves. He has obeyed the law, and He alone has obeyed that law and secured righteousness. It's all what He has done. And so now the righteousness that is offered to us is offered to us what? As a gift of grace, Romans chapter 3. And it is the result it is a righteousness that is the result of Christ's fulfillment of the law in our behalf. And thus this righteousness that will pass through God's holy, pure inspection is not an infused righteousness. It's not a righteousness of our doing. It's not a righteousness of our being changed at all. It's an imputed righteousness. Because it's 100% complete. It's 100% approved by God. It's 100% passed through, final inspection. And thus it is a righteousness that the law requires and demands and what Jesus Christ has fulfilled. He is the end of the law for righteousness. That's grace, you see. Grace of Christ achieving righteousness and taking it and imputing it to us. Not our own. His. Not our own. Not our own doing. But our receiving. Of course, the question is, how do we receive it? How do we receive this perfect righteousness that Christ has there he is sitting in heaven, the reward of his righteousness. And I'm down here on earth with all these sinners. How do I get this righteousness? It's nowhere to be found. You know, the Belgic Confession helps us out here. Therefore, to say that Christ is not enough but that something else is needed as well is a most enormous blasphemy against God, for it then would follow that Jesus Christ is only half a Savior. And therefore, we justly say with Paul that we are justified by faith alone or by faith apart from works. However, we do not mean, properly speaking, that it is faith itself that justifies us, for faith is only the instrument by which we embrace Christ, our righteousness. 
Jesus Christ is our righteousness, crediting to us all his merits and all the holy works he has done for us in our place. And faith is the instrument that keeps us in communion with him and with all his benefits. So what is accomplished by Christ alone, offered by grace alone, because he's done it, we receive how? By faith alone. By faith alone. Now, the confession points out something very important. It says faith itself is not our righteousness. Now, there are some who have taught that. Faith is righteousness. It used to be working in the law, that was righteousness, but now it's faith is righteousness. Well, you see, now it's still defaulting to you and your righteousness. Now, r- rather than being a lot of righteousness, now it's just this, this tiny little sliver called faith. And the confession points out to us, no, faith is not our righteousness. Christ is. Christ is our righteousness. He is the end of the law for righteousness. And faith, which is not a work, but is set in opposition to working, receives. Faith is an instrument. An instrument Not doing, but depending. Because, see, the bottom line, you're trusting in something for your righteousness before God. The question is, what are you trusting in? What are you trusting in for your righteousness before God that you might be accepted of God, that you might have a home in heaven? What are you trusting in? What is that righteousness you're hoping that will pass God's inspection? and admit you to heaven. And it's one or the other. Either you are trusting in some cooperation between faith and works together, or you are trusting in Christ alone through faith alone. The Belgic Confession, along with universal Reformed theology, I mean, you see this in Calvin and elsewhere, very carefully makes an interpretive notation, if not a translation notation, on Romans 3.28. We hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. When Luther translated his New Testament and came to that verse, he insisted that he say, we are justified by faith Alone. Luther wanted to put an alone in there. Apart from works of the law. And if you know anything about Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox apologists, they will complain and whine and accuse Luther of manipulating the text by putting alone in there because it's not in there. How dare he do that? But if I told you that I went to the store without anyone with me, and then you said to me, well, you went alone then? Yeah. I went alone. No one else with me. Meaning what? I went alone. That's the point. And Luther wanted us to understand the point when Paul said, we are justified by faith without any works of the law. Meaning, alone. And so Calvin understands the passage that way. Luther translated it that way, pretty bold. But to bring home the point, he did. And our Belgic Confession brings home that point. We justly say with Paul, we're justified by faith alone. By faith apart from works. Now why is it so important that we're justified by faith alone? Why is that? Because if you're not justified by faith alone, what happens? There's something else along with that faith by which you are justified. And what is that other thing? 
works. <laughs> and Paul wants us to understand that because all the works demanded have been performed and achieved by Jesus Christ for righteousness. He has put an end of the law for righteousness. All the works the law could possibly call for. Jesus has done them all. Leaving you what? Faith alone. Why? Because faith is that instrument through which we trust in what Jesus has done, nothing, even with God's help, that may be produced in our lives. Now, what's the value of that? Well, first of all, it's a way of salvation. It's a way of salvation. We're headed toward a day of judgment. Do you have what it takes as a (laughs) non-Christian? No way. How about as a Christian? Do you have now? Do you have what it takes? You have enough righteousness in your life to pass through that final judgment? No. You're still headed that day. Can't get around it. God's righteous judgment will be revealed, and Paul says that righteous judgment that will be revealed in the final day was revealed in the cross ahead of time for you that you might trust in Jesus Christ alone and be saved. And might look to that final day of judgment coming up. And you know it's coming up. You know why you know it's coming up as a Jesus, as a Christian? You know it's coming up as a Christian. Why? Because I'm looking and trusting in Jesus for that final judgment has appeared in history. Confirming it's on its way. And I can face it with a big smile on my face. Because the righteousness required I possess by faith alone. Not by anything I've done in Jesus Christ. And the result of that by Christ alone, by grace alone, by faith alone, is the only way we can say to God's glory alone. Why? Well, Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul gives the example of Abraham. He says, Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, was uh, justified, if Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not toward God. If Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, was justified by works, what can he say? I did something. You get credit for it. But not before God. See, faith alone means it's all of God's glory alone because it's all of God's grace alone and it's all of Christ alone and therefore all the boasting is in God alone. He gets the glory. And the righteousness spoken of is not the grace of works where I do something, even if I may be helped by God Himself in doing it, which in and of itself is nothing wrong, but doesn't qualify for righteousness. But not the grace of works, but the grace of faith. Not doing anything. Positively not doing Look at Romans 4, 5 again. And to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly. Justifies the ungodly. The guy who's headed for judgment, he's going to fry. He's going to toast. He's going to be in hell forever. The ungodly person. They should look at final judgment and say, I, uh, how do I get out of this? Verse 5 says God justifies him who can't do a thing about it. Does not work. Utterly given up on himself. It is this way of righteousness, this way of forgiveness through Christ's 
active and passive obedience, through his bearing the curse on the cross, through his living a righteous life in conformity to the law of God. It's this way of righteousness that boasts alone toward God. God, thank you. All praise to you. All credit to you. Everything demanded of me, you've done in Jesus. Everything calling for my condemnation, you've taken care of in Jesus. My boast is all toward you. Thus, I trust your promise that you will justify me, the helpless, hopeless, ungodly person. This message of righteousness through faith, not of works, is derived from Christ alone, by grace alone, and thus by faith alone. That gives glory to God alone. So as we sit here this morning, I ask you a question. The Jews stumbled because they couldn't seem to extract themselves from the righteousness of their works. And they stumbled over the stumbling stone laid in Zion. Now I ask yourself this question, where's Zion? It's heaven. <laughs> See, Christ, by His righteousness, achieved heaven. And they could look to Christ and say, He's the end of the law for righteousness. There He is in heaven. <laughs> he did it all. I trust Him. And they had a zeal for God, but Paul says it's not according to knowledge. They were ignorant of God's righteousness. They're ignorant of the righteousness of God who sent Jesus to perfectly obey that law so that righteousness may be found in Christ, received by faith. You may give your best spirit-filled righteousness in this life. And it's a good thing to give your best spirit-filled righteousness with the grace of God operating in you. That's a good thing. But that righteousness, you can't Get around it. It's a Swiss cheese righteousness. It has holes in it. It's not a complete, total, perfect righteousness, though it is real in your life by the work of the Holy Spirit. What you need is a righteousness that's not your own. You need Christ. Christ, who has borne your curse for the forgiveness of your sins, which keeps you out of heaven. But Christ, whose righteous and flawless life has secured heaven. You see, you not only need your sins forgiven, which keeps you out of heaven, you need righteousness that gets you into heaven. You need the whole Christ. And how do you get him? How do you get this 100% forgiveness? How do you get this 100% righteousness in Jesus Christ? Listen to me. Faith, trust, dependency. As Paul says, believe on Him in your heart and express that belief by prayer. Call upon Him. That's what calling does. That's what prayer does. Expresses that faith and places it in Christ to be clothed in His righteousness, not your own. A righteousness that is imputed perfectly because it's Christ's own righteousness and received by faith. Let us pray. Heavenly Father.